Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Terrell from Terrell03.com, and it is exactly 7:44. And I realized again that the recorder's not on, and and uh, the group. You can see John's here, soaking in the sun. Kathy and Gary, and you can see kind of what we we've been discussing, and they're I've been talking a lot about the virus in in my training, in um, the medical field and how I'm spooked about what's going on right now. And the topic came up, Kathy wants to know about the Seventh Day People. A lot of you guys have questions about the Seventh Day People. So um, I realized, holy cow, and I apologize. I know I'm, I'm, I'm been up since way early this morning and, and I processed, well, there must be 50 or 60 or 70 new subscribers. I can't tell you how many subscriptions. New subscriptions, Nano Silver and all that that I processed today. And made the video for today, and um, my brain is just shot. But I'm hanging in there, doing my best. And um, so now we're going to have questions. Sometimes when you're really tired, you feel like that you need to tie a knot on your rope before you slide and just fall off the edge. Is whenever God can, can use you. And I apologize. I, I, I ate quick, quicker than I should have. Haven't had much time today, so I'm having a little bit of trouble. But um, I'm going, I, I, I'm going to make it. So I'm going to turn the mic back on and then address some of these questions that are here. Okay, everybody, I, uh, I made a little introduction for the uh, a minute and 40 seconds worth of introduction for those that are following us on YouTube. And I, I told them that uh, I'm spooked about what's, uh, if you go up the, you can see that oh, Mary Greeley and the coronavirus may affect men, men's fertility. I'm not too concerned about that. There are questions about if I'm heading to Arkansas and uh, soaking in the sun. Yeah, um, I highly, highly recommend that you read Gary Allen's book, Nunder Call of Conspiracy. It's just a thin little book. I recommend you, you can read it in one evening. Well, some people can read it in one evening. And I read it when I was a teenager. My Uncle Jack gave it to me. He was a professor. In, uh, in for college and a really a brainiac guy and then he decided heck with all that I'm gonna be a general contractor and then uh, so he taught my father my father taught me and I became a, a general contractor in the 1980s that's so when I was building in Georgia actually I don't know my first general contractors license and then uh, bricklayer vested journeyman bricklayer moved to Minnesota yeah in uh, quite some time so I have a lot of experience in the construction field believe it or not and then on the other side of the equation in the medical field, president and CEO of Press Medical Corporation developing new techniques for removing kidney stones, which is the reason that I'm stone free today, pressurizing my entire urinary system and removing them all in a single procedure. It's the stones that create more stones. And patent pending three times, never could get it through. Burned $100,000 of Jim Paul's money. Uh, trying to do my, doing my best. But, uh, but anyway, the um, now it looks like we're going to settle in here, and Kathy is asking a question because uh, she wants to know more about the sixth and seventh day people. And there's a mention of that in the news in today's newsletter, and it's amazing how many people want to know more about that. So when you're looking in Scripture, then you're going to read about God creating man. Genesis 1 started 26 through 28 in our image. And when it, the speaker there is God who is from Revelation 1 8. He is speaking to God who was, who is the priest, and the God to come, God who is to come. He is the prophet of God who is. And God who is is represented by the eagle. God to come is represented by the lion cannot attack a lion from the front you better run and you can't get come up behind a bullock either one of the biggest ways that a person died back in the old days was the kick of the bullock that he was using to plow his field because you get behind one so the bullock is a symbol of God who was from the past he is the priest and he knows everything about the past God to come knows everything about the future the prophet for God who is. God who is knows everything about now. Right now. In the moment. 
He's the one that's speaking in Genesis 126, make creating man, male and female. And the next verse is going to be, be fruitful, multiply, because the seed is the blood witness. So you're seeing the three witnesses that are interacting there in Genesis 1, and again in Genesis 2, when the Lord God begins working, that's the Lamb of God who created Adam in the garden, which is a garden environment in heaven, until he's kicked out, and then he lives his life in a skin, human skin, Genesis 3.21. Everything from Genesis 2-7 to Genesis 3-21 is happening in heaven. It's whenever they're put in. You notice there's no procreation. Eve comes out, boom. There's no procreation. They're in heaven. No such thing as procreation there. It's after they're put in scans. Then they ate of the seed. They ate of the fruit of knowledge and good of good and evil. The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, people characterize as an apple. and It's not. That is the seed, the lineage of Cain and Abel. It's the serpent seed versus, or the devil seed, Satan seed, whatever you want to characterize it as, versus the righteous branch. So you have her seed against your seed. Those two are eaten, and Eve is mother of all living, all living, all living, six-day people and seven-day people. But she's in this instance, she's being characterized as the person that's, that is the mother of all the living of the seventh day race. Of all that's in the earth. In other words, all men. And Adam is the opposite. He is the spirit witness who's testifying for all the angels. Because the angel half and the man half makes an immortal soul. When you come, begin to see that, then you can begin understanding the differences between the six-day people and the seventh-day people. The six-day people are all created by God in Genesis 1.1. They evolved from the waters of Genesis 1.20. They include amphibious races, reptilian races, and mammalian races. You know which came first, amphibious races. They've been here for millions and millions of years. Reptilian races came after them. Mammalian races came after them. So the Chinese, the Aborigines, the Native American Indians, they all are RH positive exclusive. Every single one of them has RH positive blood, which means they have the Reese monkey gene, just like the suns from space. That they are cousins of the sons from space. They've been here for a long, 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 long time. And it's looking like Dave made it here. Good to see you, Dave. So um, you can't see what's on the board, Dave, but um, we're talking about seventh, sixth and seventh day people. And that was written about in today's, um, in, the, in today's newsletter. So if you want to gain an understanding... I mean, if you go to the newsletter, then you're going to get a better understanding because it's, t it's typed out and I'm pointing to the type as I'm giving my commentary. So in short, for those that are watching us on YouTube and for those that are here, the six day people represent the members of Adam's body on the day that God created him perfect as a God in God's infinite realm. He created him perfect, mature, complete. Knowing everything, perfect, just like all the other gods he ever made. God is in the business of creating gods in the infinite realm. That's what he does. They're all infinite. Every single one of us are infinite. And we're created with members of our body. Those are the people that the Chinese represent. The American Indians represent. The Seventh-day people that are here are not they were not created inside of Adam on the day he was made in the infinite realm. They were created just like Adam with members in their body too. In the infinite realm. So just imagine that you are in, an, in the infinite realm right now. And you're a God. You're infinite. And you're just, you were created perfect just like every other God. You kind of all look the same. Think about it. How many different ways do you make perfect? There's only one way to make perfect. God made us all. And we're all, we all look the same. The thing, what it reminds me of is when we go for our rewards 
at the judgment seat of Christ. And whenever we approach that throne, we all look the same. We all have the same garment. We all look the same. Can't tell the difference. If you've seen us from behind, I swear you cannot, say, you cannot tell the difference. It's only after the judgment. After the judgment, every one of your brothers is going to turn around and face the rest of us. And we're going to see them in their glory that God created. He is going to put his, the rewards on them. They're going to have great rewards. They're going to have a crown. They're going to have a scepter. We're talking about the greater mature brothers in Christ. They're going to have a scepter. It's going to have a big stone on it. The edges of the stones are going to glisten. The light is going to shine brightly. And it's going to reflect in, inside of your eyeballs. The power that's coming from each son of God is magnificent. You're going to know everything there is to know about looking at your brother by the stones on his chest plate and the ornaments that are all over his body, in his crown, in his scepter. Every little ring, every stone means something. And we all know what that means in heaven. Well, in the infinite realm, let's take this over to the infinite realm when God created us. Everybody's the same. I mean, we're perfect, we're glorious, it's all cool. But we're all the same. So what makes us different? What makes us unique is that we all incarnate inside of one another. You incarnate inside of me, I incarnate inside of you. So you think I'm kind of cool. You put me right at your right hand. Boom, right at your right hand. Who The, the brother that you put, the, you, out of all of God's infinite realm, you're going to choose one brother and you're going to put him right at your right hand. And you're going to pick another brother and put him right beside him and another one right beside him and another one right beside him all the way around your table. And then you're going to have brothers that, well, you don't think very much of for one reason or another, like Judas. I mean, just to give you an example of somebody on the far end of the spectrum, even though, I mean, he's a bad guy. He's in the lake of fire, going to the lake of fire, but you see what I mean. Those are the guys you could put on your left side. You're going to have the worst right here, the guy that you're never going to listen to, right here on your left. And then the guy that you're going to listen to, well, maybe right beside him. And then so you've got your people on your left and the people on your right. But you're going to position your sons, the, the sons of God, your brethren, differently than every other brother. And it's the way you position your brothers that's going to determine your outward appearance. Now, God is going to look at you in the way that you arranged your brethren, and he's going to decide, is this son wise or is this son foolish? Because if you put all the bad guys at your right hand, God's going to say, you're foolish. I don't know why you'd ever put him over there. And you're going to have a lower standing in the mountain of God. God's going to look at some of them. He's going to say, look, he's got Tarot, and he's got Kathy, and he's got Gary, right at his right hand. These guys that are right on the ball, John, Dave, right at the right hand. That means he's wise. God's going to put him higher in the mountain of God. That's how God does things. So we have great works because of the way we position our brothers. Some of us show common sense of the spirit, which does, by the way, in the infinite realm, spirit doesn't mean anything. Soul doesn't mean anything. Body doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing. As man, woman, angel, none. There's none of that. All of that is created in this earth realm, in the broken universe, so that we can replay over and over again things already done in the infinite realm. That's why we're here. We're doing things that, are, that have already been done. So, to answer your... Now, with that foundation, we're going to go and answer, Kath, Kathy, we, we want to help you to understand more about the six-day people of Genesis 1 and the seventh day people of Genesis 2. Many people interpret Genesis 2 to be a replay of Genesis 1, and it's not. God, Elohim, is the creator who created the heaven and the earth of Genesis 1 1. Science believes that the creation came from the Big Bang. That is a myth. If you Google the Big Bang theory of creation is a myth in my name, Terrell, then you can read about it. I wrote about it a year, more than a decade ago. It's a myth. The Big Bang of creation does not explain how anything was created. The Big Bang of creation describes how the perfect creation of Genesis 1-1 was destroyed. Perfect singularity expressions. Perfect hosts filled the earth of Genesis 1-1. It was made void to reproduce Adam's murder in the infinite realm. So when Adam was murdered, 
guess what? You were incarnate inside of him because you're Adam's brother. So yes, you're a God, Psalms 82, 6. John 10, 34 through 36, Christ quotes David. You are a God. Even though he's addressing Israel, the truth is there for you too. The thing is, you're still there. And from our perspective, you're frozen motionless in an infinite universe. Motionless. Because all the events of heaven and all the events of earth are going to take place before one instant passes in the infinite room, from our perspective. That's the difference between infinite and almost infinite, which heaven is, and then finite, which is the earth realm. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth, and then the earth and the heaven are going to be closer to the same size. Currently, heaven of Genesis 1-1 is where Michael's fighting the archangel. Um, Michael the Archangel is fighting the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Michael the Archangel has already severed the, the dragon's head, but it has not hit the ground yet. The dragon is fall, collapsing. He's falling over. His tail is falling across the sky, but he's stopped. In, he is moving in such slow motion that he's been falling since the times of Genesis 2. So we're living in the same evil age from Genesis 1-2, the when this, this age is defined by the darkness of Genesis 1-2, the evil forces and powers of this darkness, Ephesians 6-12, the same darkness of Genesis 1-2. As the dragon is falling over, his tail is falling across the sky, more rapidly, by the way, than he's falling, and that is how the stars are being dislodged from the heaven realm to incarnate here. In the heavenly places, where they are in power right now. So whenever the whenever we are raptured, First Thessalonians four start at thirteen, First Corinthians fifteen start at fifty one. Whenever we put on immortality is the same moment, the same instant that the, the devil and all of his servants, all of his minions are going to be chained. And we are going to occupy those heavenly seats and assist Elijah in the restoration of all things on this earth. Every single person that participates in that, you and me, we're all seven-day people. Every single one of us, seven-day people. Six-day people are, were members of Adam's body in the infinite realm on the day he was made. They're represented by the Chinese, the Aborigines, all the people with RH positive blood, beardless races. They've been here for millions of years. The suns from space, the amphibious, the reptilian races, they're terrestrial. They're from here too. They're God's custodians. They're the ones that are going to clean up the radioactive mess whenever um, Miss uh, Know-It-All, <laughs> you would like to put your hands up? Um, that's very, very nice of you, but please put your hand down. This is a, this is a private group, and um, I've been asked a question by Kathy, and pretty much that's, what, that's the way that the road's going to go. That's the way that it's going to go. But I appreciate your uh, your wanting to participate. But um, this room is a little bit different. We meet once a week for two hours. And uh, if there's nobody asking questions, then I'm happy to give up the mic. But other than that, then probably need, just need to put your hand down. Um, so give me... No, I'm not an Adventist. I'm not denominational, uh, um, Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian. I'm from a family of ministers that are mostly Pentecostal that will argue with me at the family uh, get-togethers forever and ever. Um, they don't know the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. And so they mix it together, the water and blood ministries of Jesus Christ, and they create their own false gospel, um, pretty much. So um, in, in wrapping up for Kathy, so she can understand the difference between six-day and seven-day people. The Chinese people represent those that were created in Adam on the day that he was created. Um, I'm sure that that might have uh, meaning somewhere, but I'm afraid that you're going to take a hike. Um, so... I, uh, and my apologies, you guys. A, um, if you've been around Pal Talk for as long as me, then you're going to realize that there are just troublemakers that go room to room and want to cause um, issues. Generally, the people that really want to 
to learn something, they come in and they lurk. They're quiet. And they're going to absorb what they can. And then they're going to, you know, maybe raise their hand. They're going to ask a few questions of the guy that owns the room. And then, you know, in the text. And then they're going to come to the mic. They don't just come and jump on the mic like this guy was trying to do. So um, the, the ancient races that have been here, the amphibious, the reptilian, you, you hear about mostly the reptilian. They are even newer than the amphibious races. The spaceships that are flying around, the spaceships that took Elijah to heaven, they were being piloted by those that were here before the mammalian races even existed. And th where did they take them? They took them to heaven. So there are spaceships that are in this realm that can travel beyond the veil because God said so. Those are his custodians. Don't you think, if you guys, any of you guys are Star Trek guys, I've been watching Star Trek since the 60s. The Klingons and all that stuff. The, the ancient races, they have technology far beyond anything you see on Star Trek. They could destroy this planet to the push of one button. And they don't. And Anunnaki and all that stuff about their bad guys and they're coming to enslave the race. They want our gold, blah, blah, blah. Myth. The six-day people, the, the ones that the, are in space, they are God's custodians. They serve Almighty God just like we do. And they know the black star is almost here and they're going to be here to clean up the mess. They're going to help Elijah restore all things like we are from heaven. So, um... That is the difference between sixth and seventh day people. The gospel is for only for seventh day people. And my apologies to anybody that's Chinese, American Indian, 100% American Indian. I am part American Indian, Creek Indian. It's a small part, but it is a part. It's part of my heritage, and I'm very proud of it. But I'm a seventh day person. I'm a God just like you guys in God's infinite realm. I'm a member of Adam's body, and I died when Adam died. Now God's restoring Adam, one member at a time, including me, including you, so that we become members of the last Adam's body in heaven, which is Christ, Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Adam from the infinite realm is the first Adam. The earth of Genesis 1-1 is the incarnation of Adam. The incarnation of heaven in Genesis 1-1 is the incarnation of God's word. Sent by God to restore Adam. That's his only job here. So you have judgment because you have to separate satanic um, people, satanic hosts, those that help Satan kill Adam, from the victims, which is us, members of Adam's body, ones that were caught up in all and everything that happened. So God chooses us through the gospel. Second Thessalonians 2, start 13. It's through the gospel that he chooses us. He sends the preacher. He convicts us through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Word and the faith of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of promise, as three witnesses enter our soul to become, it, the heaven in us, to become Christ in you. And then we feed that, the Pauline epistles. And then inside the eyes open up. It starts off as a baby in a manger, just like baby Jesus. And then we feed it. Pauline epistles, Pauline epistles every day. And it grows up, and then we're able to see these things relating to the mystery. God sees you growing up, the inner man in you growing up, and he taps you on the shoulder and says, okay, now you can see this. Now you can see that. And he's gradually opening up and allowing us to see more and more and more. And one of the reasons that this program started back in December is because the black star is almost here. And now with the coronavirus that's going, this is part of the elite fail-safe plan that was predicted years ago, and now it's happening. So I'm getting really spooked about it. So on the one hand, I'm doing everything to help you guys to, to have greater rewards in heaven. The more things that you can get right about grace doctrine, the more bad, unsound doctrine that you can weed out the better you're going to stand at the judgment seat, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And the, the better that you're going to, whenever you put your rewards on that altar, we're all going to do it. All of our brethren will be behind us. Christ and God are going to be right in front of us. We're all going to put our works on that throne. I mean, on that altar. 
and Christ's hand's going to come up and he's going to set it ablaze. And if you have the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, then you're, that means you did good. So whenever the, the flame burns, it's not going to be smoky. It's just going to be, it's just going to ignite. Not much smoke. But if you have a world full of earthly works, wood, hay, and straw, Paul talks about, it's 1 Corinthians 3, start about 10. The wood, hay, and the straw, you don't want that. Because the wood, hay, and the straw on the altar is going to turn black, smoky. It's going to turn into soot. And that's going to cause your beautiful white garment to turn dark and cloudy. You don't want that. So that's what this, the, the mystery explained and all this is about, is to help you to be able to stand in endure in that day so that you have a nice white garment so that you can go into the day of the Lord with the whitest garment possible, the most rewards possible. Because we have the opportunity to extend ourselves up in the the mountain of God in the infinite realm and in the pyramid in heaven. This is a pyramid, Christ is the capstone. We're trying to get up near the top by the time we get to the ages of the ages. That's the objective. So the way I envision the pyramid, and, and there's multiple pictures of that in the book, in my book, The Mystery Explained, is that the base at the bottom of the pyramid, whether you have most stones, are kind of like efficiency apartments. You go in, not much to see, and you turn around again. As you go higher and higher in the mountain of God, the accommodations become more elaborate. And whenever you go into the abode of a son of God that's underneath Christ, Paul, Barnabas, Titus, those guys, whenever you walk inside their abode, it is like an entire realm. That's the difference from being, being in the bottom of the mountain of God in the infinite realm and the difference in being in the bottom of the pyramid in the heavenly pyramid that is the, uh, the temple that we're in. That's our abode. That's the difference in being in the bottom and being in the top. Okay, a lot of people have been asking about that. In the last two newsletters, there's quite a bit of information on that. And uh, just a little symbolic thing, miss know-it-all. <laughs> there's probably 10,000 things Miss Know-it-all could have learned if she would have, you know, looked at my website up there, gone there, watched some of the videos, and subscribed for only two bucks a month and got my book for free, The Mystery Explained. But instead, no, Miss Know-it-all is going to come to the front and teach us something. All right? That's, um, that is, if, if you're going to go to a chat room and you're going to share the, like we're doing right now, that is the, not the way you want to do it. Like after, at, after, um, I owe you five extra minutes. So after 9.05, you know, if you lurk around and you go to some of these other rooms on Pal Talk, see what they got to say, then you're going to notice that you're not going to want to do it like Miss Know-It-All to go in, put your hand up. And start typing down here. Oh, I, you know, I, are you going to let go of the mic? Oh, blah, blah, blah. no, no. That's not how you want to do things. You're going to get just like Miss Know-It-All. You're going to get bounced. So the the way you go in is you go and you listen, you lurk, and then you type a little bit. You ask questions of the room owner. It's generally a good idea to address the room owner first, and then once you are acknowledge the room owner, then you can start talking to other people. Because if you start trying to talk to other people in the room, without addressing the room owner, then the room owner is going to feel like that, you know, you're a bad guy and you're trying to be an interloper. You're trying to be like the Black Star, an intruder. Um, both sides of your family are Pentecostal, John. Then uh, I'm from a family of ministers and I would have to say that all of my, all of them, my um, Church of God, the... Um, Assemblies of God, the uh, the speaking of tongues. If anybody reads Acts 2, 1 through 11, is all you need to read. Just read 1 through 11. Three of those verses are going to tell you what tongues is. True tongues means that, one, like me, I'm speaking in English, right? So here I am speaking in English. If I'm speaking in true tongues, that by the way, that's what we speak in heaven. Everybody in heaven speaks in tongues. But if I'm speaking in true tongues and you're a German 
and you're in front you're, you're you're French you're Chinese you're Japanese you can have people of a hundred different languages and different dialects in the same place and everybody there hears in their own language and in their own dialect that's true tongues so when Elijah speaks when he comes and he has the Holy Spirit on on him he's going to speak in his language but everybody that hears him will hear them hear Elijah speaking in their own tongue and in their own dialect as if he was raised in their own village that's true tongues and there's no true tongues and members of my family they're babbling and all this stuff and I'm just rolling my eyes going oh my god what are they doing because they don't understand it they're under deluding influence members of my own family you know it makes my heart bleed I mean, I'm I feel terrible for them but it is what it is and like Christ says you know those that do the will of the father those are my brothers and sisters not those that are born from the same womb doesn't work that way it's a we're spiritual we're together and bound together by not by the blood that's in our veins but by the spirit that we share that we drink together and that spirit is Christ that's the thing that we have in common that's the things that makes us brothers and we are brothers in the infinite realm and in heaven too and not just that we're members of one another individually and whenever you start dissecting the Greek and you go to Romans and you go to chapter 12 start at verse 4 and read what Paul says in the Greek language he's going to be speaking about how we are individually we're not just members of Christ's body as he's describing to the Corinthians most of them babes in uh, chapter 10 11 and 12 12 particularly but he's going to be described because he never tells the Corinthians that they are members of one another that's a deeper concept the thing that he's sharing with the Romans and um, that's we take carry that to the infinite realm and we also gather meaning from Galatians I mean uh, Genesis 4 it's right at the top when it says that Adam knew Eve and begat the idea that knowledge and going into is the same thing that's the concept that carries over from the infinite realm it carries through the language the Hebrew language that's written from right to left by the way in the the uh, the language of angels is written from right to left too everything's backwards in the angels realm by the way so some languages like like the Roman like Latin and English we write from the left to right but some languages are written from right to left like the Hebrew language is so every time you're reading the Hebrew it wasn't actually written the way you're reading it it's, read, it's actually written backwards from the way that you're reading it so um that's the truth about tongues that everybody's hearing in their own language the problem with the Pentecostals and I'm speaking from experience I'm not talking about somebody else I'm talking about my own family is that they mix the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God together if you go to first John 5 and start at 6 then Jesus Christ is the one that came in water and, and blood not in water only water and in blood they don't realize that the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of water it's part of the kingdom doctrine that is Christ's water ministry they don't realize that and emphasize it to separate that the gospel of the kingdom Peter John and James from Paul Barnabas and Titus the gospel of the grace of God they don't know how to separate it they just put it all together and I've, I've argued at family reunions from my minister uncles and they are trying to talk me down they're pushing me back they're being uh, being obnoxious to me so telling me that hey my my doctrine encompasses your doctrine it has both it has this and that they think that that it's greater because they have the water part and the blood part mixed together and it's not when you when you dilute the the blood then you ruin everything that's what Peter's saying in second Peter chapter 3 started 14 concerning the wisdom given him just as our brother beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him wrote to you and all these things in his epistles that the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looking into the eyeballs of my uncles knowing full well that they are in the lake of fire right now and there's nothing they can do about it they cannot see the differences 
the diluting influence has them. And whenever they par they died, which they have now, then they wake up in the lake of fire, just like we do wake up as one night's sleep with Christ. So, um, I mean, I feel bad for them, but it is what it is. And um, so my job is to rightly divide scripture and to dispense that the way that God has shown me from the time from the 80s and the 90s and and uh, now in the uh, in the roaring 20s it looks like that we're almost out of time as far as the black stars almost here the uh, so uh, you guys need to um, to lead me with another question. I think that uh, Kathy got her answer about the Sixth-day and Seventh-day people, that the Chinese, the Aborigines, Native American Indians, they've been here for a long, long, long time. And they're they're basically beardless. They're Sixth-day people. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Seventh-day people are gods from God's infinite realm, and they are here to be judged one way or the other. To the Sixth-day people, they can live more than once in, a, in an age. They can come again and again and again and again and again. They evolve. They ev they're evolving upwards and they're they're evolving outwards to make larger and larger spirals going up and up and up. We're totally different. They're connected to heaven of Genesis 1:8. That's where they belong. That's where the heart is. Our heart is connected to Genesis, the heaven of Genesis 1:1. We do not belong in this realm. We do not belong as members of Adam's body. We incarnated there because we wanted to, not because we were created there. We were in Adam when Satan murdered him, and so that's why we're here. Okay, let's see Gary's question. Let's see. Gary, Romans 8, 28 says, if we confess our sins, etc., do we still confess our sins to Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? Okay, that's your first question. And the right answer is you do not ever, ever, ever confess your sins to Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Neither one. Neither one of them is the right answer. The right answer is is you can you confess your sins to God. Always make your request known to God. That's the only deity that exists is God. You are going to communicate to God through Jesus Christ so Jesus Christ is always going to his name is going to be on your lips because you're going to say and you're going to give thanks to God and when you're praying the thing that God loves the most is God loves when we give thanks he loves when we give thanks for anything a heart of thanksgiving a heart of thankfulness that's one of the things that I learned by the way from not from any of my uncles or from my father or my mother. I learned it from the cavern owner when I lived in Arkansas. He has a spirit about him. He's an ex-con and he's this he's got all these got bad things about him. He's a very large family, loved by his family. He's a former judge. I admired him greatly. And that man taught me more about thankfulness than anybody that I ever met in my life. I'm gonna stand before God and reward him. I don't care that he's an ex con or whatever. Thankfulness, the spirit of thankfulness. Whenever you receive something with a spirit of thankfulness or you give something in a spirit of thankfulness, that that impresses God more than anything. I can tell you from experience, having to stand in front of God's throne and pray and want this and want that, it was whenever the spirit of thankfulness that was entered into the equation that movement started to happen. So every single prayer you pray, every single one of them goes directly to God directly straight to God through Jesus Christ God cannot interact with you straight pray always to God through Jesus Christ the reason is because God is infinite infinite heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain God first Kings chapter 8 started 26 wait a minute yeah the highest the high, yeah heaven in the highest heaven Solomon and David know know that. Solomon and David knew the difference between heaven of Genesis 1:8 and heaven of Genesis 1:1, the heaven and the highest heaven, like I do. They knew it. You guys should know it too. At least you're on the right track to knowing it. But 
one mistake that people make is praying to Jesus because that removes God from the equation and God hates that. That's idolatry. Remember, I mean, if you read whenever John the Baptist is testifying about Christ, he talks about he who's from heaven is above all. He that's from the earth speaks of the earth, which is John the Baptist. He's the man of the earth. He's Adam of Genesis 1.1. He's the earth. Christ is the one that's heaven. So when Christ is testifying about John the Baptist, heaven is testifying about the earth. But even John the Baptist is not going to pray to Jesus. He's going to pray to God through Jesus. The only way that you can interact with something infinite is through that which is almost infinite and put there specifically for your benefit. The one mediator between God and man is Christ Jesus. He's the entire almost infinite realm of heaven incarnate as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for our benefit so that we can communicate to God through him. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is incarnate inside of you. That's what Christ in you is. Heaven of Genesis 1-1, incarnate in you. Okay? So you're going to pray to God through Christ. And as you're praying, especially towards the end, that, well, this is what I do, is thank God for hearing you through his son who you sent to die for me. So then you're acknowledging God's work in sending his son and you're acknowledging Christ in doing the work and setting up the line of communication. But the thing is, when you're praying to the Almighty, you're not looking out into the sky. And that Out in the sky is where the God of this world is. You're praying to God inwardly through Christ in you because inside of Christ in you is God in him. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, start at 16, and read through about how we're a new creature. We don't know Christ any longer as, as he was known in the flesh. We don't know anybody that way anymore. Then you're going to see that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Guess what? God has been in Christ since he rested in Genesis 1, I'm sorry, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. It says that God rested. It's like he's not doing anything, right? No, that's not true. The truth is God has been working all the time through his son, who is the Lord God, who started working in Genesis 2, 4. He is inside of his son, reconciling the world to himself. That's what Paul's telling you. He's revealing it kind of in passing that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So we have the word of reconciliation, which is the gospel, the grace of God. We preach it, but it's not really us preaching it. It's God in Christ in us preaching it. God in Christ in us is reconciling our brethren to himself through us. So whenever, then whenever you realize that, that you're the servant, you're the water witness, Christ is the blood witness, God's the spirit witness, it's the power of Almighty God that's inside of you, that's empowering you, that's renewing you day by day. That's what's renewing the inner man. You're reading the word from the Pauline epistles, which is the soul of the Bible, those 13 epistles, and that's feeding you from the inside. And the new man inside you is growing up and growing stronger, mightier. First you, you crawl like a little kid, you're, first you're in the manger, then you're crawling, then you're trying to stand and you're, you're, you're stumbling, and just like when you're a kid. You, then you learn to walk, then you learn to run. So after you've been doing this for decades, which I'm sorry to say we don't have that much time now. The black star is almost here. But you see what I mean. The, the, the new inner man is the person that I'm speaking to you always. It's the new inner man that's in you that has the ability to show you the things I'm trying to share with you. All I have is seeds. That's all, any, that's all you're ever going to have. That's a very important lesson to learn in life is that all you have is seeds. You cannot open somebody else's eyes. You cannot help them to see the mystery. It's like, it's like uh, Morpheus and Neo in the Matrix. He couldn't tell him what the Matrix was. He had to show him what it was. And the way that I can show you, right, is through giving you these seeds. That's all that I have. 
the new inner man that's in you takes those seeds and God causes the growth and your new inner man grows up inside and it's your new inner man that's going to show you these things. That I'm only your tutor. I only have seeds. That's all I have. And I'm going to give them to you the best that I can. And you're going to be able to grow so much until the day that you decide that you're going to help others. You're going to seek out other members of Christ's body for those who Christ died for. And then you're going to show them the difference between the two Gospels and the New Testament, the two churches, the four baptisms. All right, that's how you're going to grow to the next level. As long as you're only reading the Bible to feed yourself, God's only going to show you so much. The next level is whenever you have it, the burning desire in your heart for your brethren to see it the way that you do. And then you, whenever you want them to see that more than you want it for yourself, that's whenever God's going to turn open the floodgates. He's going to start just flooding you with it because your desire to help your brethren is stronger than you want to help yourself. And God says, I've got to be part of that. God's going to start pouring the water on a little more. You're going to start seeing things that you never were able to see before. And it's going to become like intuition to you. And it's a spiritual thing. Spiritual knowledge comes from one source, and that's God. There's only one source. Whether it's the devil's activities, this is kind of a bad thing. It took me a long time to grow up and realize this, but there's only one source. One source of power, and that's God. That's it. It's God who sends that deluding influence. Read the words, especially in the Greek, from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at 7. And by the time you get to 10, 11, and 12, you'll see that it's God that sends that deluding influence. There's only one power. Satan doesn't send that deluding influence. God does. The power that Satan has comes from the same source that we get our power from, from God. The only way that Satan has any power whatsoever to do anything is because he's given it by God. It sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? But this is how God tests us through fire. Like making a fine sword. You can't make a fine sword without heat and fire. Precious metals, right? That's what God's doing with us. And I know Dave is going through a lot like I'm going through a lot. And, and, and Mike Kelly, she was just on the phone here. She's going through a lot too right now. I can't tell you how many times she's been working at, this, at, at, at the Goodwill. I can't tell you how many times that she's ever even called me from work about anything. And today she's called me, what, three times, four times? Because the, the devil's children are empowered. They are almost about to be chained, and they know it. They're, it's like their last gasp. They're, they're running with this plague, this coronavirus. They're running. With, they, they've been trying to impeach Trump from the left, the deep state. The evil that you see there, they're becoming more bold. Because we're the veil, as we're getting closer to this veil, then there is something, fluid dynamics, there's something that's happening here, a compression. As we're moving towards this veil, to where Satan feels empowered, that he has to act out. And I'm seeing signs of it more and more everywhere. And what's happening to Mike Kelly, she has the purest heart that you've ever seen in a person. She really, she's a really, really lovely person. And uh, she wouldn't hurt a soul. And they're treating her down there t so terribly. And she's a hard worker. But the devil's children are surrounding her. And they're spitefully using her. And somebody else just got promoted ahead of her to management. She, she moved up from cashier to supervisor. Now she, it was her turn to be up, up to manager. They moved somebody that is a slacker. And somebody that is a gossiper. And somebody that's one of the devil's kids. And it has, her, it has her kind of freaked out. And, yeah, the heart, the heart, it's, you, you're not alone, so can, And Dave, you know, I know you know. And I'm going through the same thing. What's been going on with me, thank God that God gave me good genes. I'm from a strong family, four strong boys. And thank God, I'm kind of rugged, you know, got construction. I've got the mind of an intellectual, but I also have the body of a bricklayer. So God kind of, he, he gave me kind of, I'm, I'm an odd person. When you meet me, you'll see what I mean. That um, the real high IQ and, because usually when you have the IQ, then you don't have the spiritual part. 
but God gave me that too. And then if you have the high mind part, you know, the high IQ, you can score real high on your SATs and all that, then, you, then you're a dork. You don't have the physical part. But for some reason, somehow I got lucky on that. But thank God that God made me kind of physically tough because otherwise I wouldn't be here. I'm, I'm serious. I've got my hand up. I, I wouldn't be here right now through the bacterial infection that I went through that was eating away inside of my skull for a couple of years. I'm going to the dentist every three to four months getting these special cleanings and they're letting the bacterial infection eat me from the inside. And if it wasn't for the new dentist, they wanted to send me to a dentist that was way far from here. They sent me to a specialist to do one of my uh, root canal that came, that just came out of nowhere. I've, I've only had a couple of cavities in my whole life. I have, I, I've never had a root canal or anything like that before. So why am I having a root canal now? Because that infection was eating me. And they were trying to hide it. They, they had me in the revolving door thingy. And it was affecting my brain. It was affecting my whole body. So thank God that God made me kind of tough. You know, that I could endure through that stuff. And thank God for Doug. That's helping us with this nano thing. This is really serious stuff. But you know what? If it wasn't for what happened to me with my jaw, with my, losing my teeth, and all in 20 grand spent that wiped me out, right? Then uh, Doug was a subscriber, a supporter since 2016, but we never talked about nano silver. The reason that he wrote me about it was because of what happened. And now the opportunity to help so many people is happening because of that. So if you look at the way, see what I mean? If you look at it, God uses this adversity to make us stronger. So long as we don't cave in and give up. Because if we're going to cave in and give up, go belly up, then that's what we deserve. But whenever we stand strong, we keep fighting, God fights her with us. And he can turn lemons into lemonade. God can. So I'm a, my hands up. I'm a te I, I can give a testimony for Doug and what he's done for me, and he is now helping other people. And right now we're in a real critical phase here in the United States in this incubation period. And you guys and myself and everybody in the Survivor Group program, we all need to be thinking about what we're going to be doing 30 days from now, because if we're sitting in the middle of a big city like I am right now, that's not going to be the place to be. So. About ready to make the announcement that um, I need to do something and everybody else needs to start doing something. As far as, you know, what we're doing. And yes, I know I'm going to be raptured. I know I'm going to be raptured 100%. But that's not the idea. I'm not just going to sit here on my hands and do nothing. Building the Survivor Group program is very important because the people we're going to leave behind. And we're not just thinking about ourselves. Like I said earlier, it's not until that I made that dedicated my life to helping other people to see God's wisdom, that God started making things happen for me. And so the Survivor Group program is there for those that we leave behind. I want to be there. I want to go there. I want to meet Dave. He's been my, you've been my friend for since 2015, Dave, over five years. And we haven't met you yet. And I want to. I want to shake your hand. And I want to be there. And that's where we're going to be taken from. And I'm going to have my survival supplies there. I'm going to have my guns there, my food, my tents, and everything. I'm going to have it there. And then we're going to be taken, and then those people that are we leave behind are going to use it. And then I'm going to stand in front of God, and I'm going to stand in front of Christ. And and, and then the evidence that, I, that the earth, you guys know that the birth pangs of 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, those are the earth changes. We know, I've been reporting on that for how long now? That's the evidence in my testimony. I don't have to look very far to prove to God I knew this was happening. And then the fact that I'm there and leaving my things for those that we love, that are left, God didn't call them to be a member of Christ's body. He called them to help restore all things on the earth with Elijah. Well, that's fine with me, and we're going to help him do that. So we're not just going to sit on our hands and let it happen. And then whenever we show up at the judgment, God's going to say, okay, you want credit? You want rewards for? So where's your works? Because if you read very carefully, we're not saved by works. Read Ephesians 2, start at 8, and take, read all the way through 10, and you're going to see we are created for good works. And then read about our judgment. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, 
just one verse. Uh, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, chapter 5, just read verse 10, just, just that one verse. And you see that we're going to be judged for good works or bad works done in the flesh. All right, so I don't want to be standing up there lacking for rewards in heaven. Not what since what God's been showing me since the 70s and 80s and 90s about his mystery and stuff. Uh-uh. I want to be standing up there and I want the best rewards. I want to high in the, the pyramid of God and high in the mountain of God in the infinite realm. And so that means not sitting right here where I'm at. That means acting upon my convictions. And that's what I'm planning to do. So I should be shaking your hand. Dave, I don't know exactly how things are going to shake out, but that's the um, I'm thinking more and more about wrapping up the work that's in this trailer, not so I can live in it, so I can sell it. And then uh, the, God's going to send the right person along. And then it's going to be me. And I might sell them my boat. I might sell them everything in their shed, everything, and just jump in the truck and leave. That's what I'm thinking, of, you know, right now, starting over. Over there, knowing full well, I ain't going to be there very long. All right? But doing something nonetheless. Not just sitting on my hands. So, um, oh, you sent me a virus update? Okay. And uh, if I'm a little slow in responding, then my apologies for that. So just remember that, like, tomorrow and the next day is the Black Star Report. I'm going to spend all day Wednesday putting that together and trying to do everything else, like I've been doing for the last two days for the Mystery Report. So, in, in the, the old days, then it wasn't as tough as it is now. And generally, my weekend starts after the, the video reports and things on Thursday. But now, I, I've been working all the way straight through the weekends. There's been so much work, so much to do. And that includes the work here on this trailer, you know, that I'm having to do. So, um, hardest time in your lives right now? I'm not surprised. The, um, our, our time is shorter and shorter. So I'm going to um, pause this for a second, and if you guys have, it's uh, 8.43, so you have, if you want to lead me, that's what I, I asked uh, Crystal to do, for example. That's gonna, Whenever that Crystal interview comes out, you guys are going to like it. She asked me a lot of, we talk a little bit about the virus, we talk a, bit, a little about, about the Black Star, but most of it is about God's Word. And she's starting to see it, like you guys, and she's asking some really good questions. You're going to like this. Um, this interview is coming up. So I'm going to uh, pause this for a second. And you guys, if you have a question, then that'll be like controlling the narrative for between now and the time that we um, we close it off. So I'll be back here in just a second. Okay, the uh, looks like you guys are wanting to go back in the direction of the coronavirus. So you see that link there that I shared with you? I recommend that you subscribe to his YouTube channel I did and um, I favorited his three recent videos the thing that we need in this particular scenario is access to people with letters behind their name and people you know science types biologists um, and then not just any doctor but doctors that have connections to people in the CDC. The uh, the CDC, if you haven't watched the movie Contagion, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of lessons you can learn by watching that. The the way that this that the bug in that movie is is transmissible, the way that it moved from person to person, and the way that it kills the people that are most desperately trying to fix the problem. The, that's why I shared that in one of my reports. It's the hospitals that are going to be the incubators. It's the people in the hospital, hospitals that are going to die from this bug. With the exception, of course, of those that carry the bug and never show a symptom. But they're going to carry it right out of the hospital and take it home with them, and their kids are going to take it to school. Th this thing is already out of the bag. There is no way that it can be stopped. So we're in the incubation period right now, the gestation period. We're in that period right now that runs for about a month. I'm going to say that it's a month. 
I don't believe the 24 days, 14 or the three days. And whenever you're considering gestation, whenever you even talking about incubation and gestation, the thing you have to realize is that you can be dealing with a bug that does not have any such thing. A bug that can be in somebody and it's just happy inside of somebody. It's not presenting itself. It's just in them and it's just being carried around and it's being shed and it's spreading. That seems to be what this type of bug is. So whenever you say that it has a three day, 14 day, 24 day, 30, whatever day, then that means that the bug is going to present itself within that time and that's not the case for this bug. This is a different kind of bug. This seems to be manufactured. It seems to be a biological weapon. There's so much information and disinformation that's out there that it's difficult for me to give you a solid report, especially when the CDC is behaving just exactly like the Chinese. But part of the reason the CDC is behaving like the Chinese is because of the nature of the bug. That's the thing that I've been trying to convey to you guys because I know something about this topic. But my medical background is pretty strong in this. I've been prepared for this of what's happening. So I'm, I can hear the words and, and my mind is like a computer that keywords everything you guys are saying. Everything I'm hearing on the TV, everything is going in there and then it spits out a result. And the keywording I'm hearing is making me very concerned. I'm getting this bad, bad feeling. The way that the people in China felt in December is the way I'm feeling here in the United States. It's not going to take long before this thing's going to get a foothold. It's going to be in a large city. It's likely going to be in L.A. If, my, if I was just going to pick a city, it's going to be a place that's on the West Coast. It's going to be highly populated. It's going to have plenty of illegals around. It's going to have a high Chinese population. People that went over to China for the Chinese New Year and they came back quickly in December before they even knew what was going on. This bug has likely been transmitted here before they even know what's going on. Part of it's going to be the CDC not wanting to scare people. Like the Chinese don't want to scare people. That's part of it. But that is, a, I'm afraid that's a very small percentage of this. It's because of the nature of this bug. Because it's, it's camouflaging itself. It looks like the common flu. It looks like, so whenever they come in and they, and they diagnose you with a the flu, they're not drawing your blood. They're not looking for coronavirus. Because 10 other people just came through with the same symptoms. They're giving you the same thing, the same antibiotic. The same. They're doing the same things. That's the way that our revolving door system works here in the United States. And the people are coming in and they're giving it to the caregivers and then they're leaving. And then people coming in to get care are getting it from the same caregivers. You see what I mean? We're in this period where the thing is gestating in our population. And it does not want to present itself. That's the way. Just imagine if you're a, a biologist a microbiologist, you deal in virology, and your your task that you're giving for your research group is to create the perfect biological weapon. It would be something that's just like this, a coronavirus. It's going to be shaped like this. It's going to be spherical, rather than something that's longer and skinny. It's going to be. It's going to have these horns on it. This is like the perfect biological weapon. And so, the, uh, what are we to do to be obeying to the gospel of grace? Once saved in the body of Christ, are we always saved? Very good question, Gary. Um, let's digress from the um, coronavirus for a second. Okay, what do we do to obey the gospel of the grace of God? Paul describes the gospel of the grace of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 5. It's pretty simple. The simplicity of the word of the cross message. Jesus Christ is Lord. And God raised him from the dead on the third day. In fulfillment of the scriptures. That our redemption is in his shed blood. I'm sorry. Our redemption is in Christ. It's, our redemption is in him. And our forgiveness is through his shed blood. So my faith in God as a Savior and as Christ as a Savior is in the good news that Christ died for my sins, that my, my faith is in His shed blood for doing the work. I don't do any work. 
Christ did the work. I put 100% of the weight of my salvation upon God sending his son to do the work for me. We're saved by God's grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. So that's the first part, the gospel, obeying the gospel of the grace of God. And that's it. You realize, and so many people, they want to mix the gospel of the kingdom and our word of the cross gospel. But they want to mix them together. So they say, for example, in, in the newsletter, you're going to read that I debated, I was debating with a fellow, and he said that there's no salvation without repentance. Oh, that's not true. There's no salvation without repentance if you're a member, if you're a kingdom disciple, if you're a Jew and you're obeying the gospel of the kingdom, there's no such thing. He's right about that for those members of that dispensation, but not for us, not members of Christ's body. Because we're saved by God's grace um, through faith without works, 100%. No works, no baptism, no circumcision, nothing. No sinner's prayer, nothing. What the, the good news of what God did for us in sending his son, I just shared with you. If you believe it, then that's it. Whenever you do believe it, then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is in the preacher. The, the, God has to send the preacher, Romans 10, 17. He has to send the preacher. So you're the preacher, I'm the preacher. The Holy Spirit is in me. I'm, he's the temple. I'm, my body is his temple. And the Holy Spirit of promise originates from the preacher. The faith of Jesus is in the preacher. The spirit of the word is in the preacher. Those three witnesses are the three witnesses that are conveyed to the one God is calling through the gospel, the one he's choosing through the gospel. Whenever you obey the gospel, then instantly, in the flash of a moment, God baptizes you. It was the Holy Spirit doing the baptizing, but God is the only guy that's doing any of the work, really. But if you, whenever you read the scriptures, then you are you're baptized by the one spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 14. It's the one spirit which is the Holy Spirit, baptizes us into Christ's body. So, now what does that mean? It just doesn't mean that you're baptized into Christ's body. It What it means is you're baptized into Christ's body on the cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago. So when Christ died, you died with him. Hebrews 9.27 is for a man to die once and then the judgment. God judges you then. As soon as you die with Christ, God judges you. But the thing is, he puts all of your sins, past, present, and future, on Christ. Christ paid the sin because guess what? You, me, none of us could pay for our own sins. John the Baptist couldn't pay for his own sins. Nobody can. The only way that God is going to have anybody sitting in those heavenly places, why Elijah is restoring all things, is if he forgives us through the gospel. It's the only way because we could never earn it in a million years. You could work, work, work. You couldn't earn what God is giving us for free because God needs members of Christ's body to judge the world and the angels. He needs us to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. He needs us to, so that he can dwell in Christ in us, so he can judge the world and the angels in us. So you were chosen, I was chosen. And that's it. So he sent the preacher, we obeyed. That's the first part of your question. Now the second part of your question is, are we once saved in the body of Christ? Are we always saved? Absolutely, 100% for sure. Yes. Read Ephesians 2, start at 4. You are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Whenever scripture says, when God says through his word that you're seated, that means you're done. Finished product. Then you're going to, going to go to Colossians 3 and start at 1. And whenever, by the time you get to verse 4, you're going to learn some valuable things. You're going to learn... Well, that we're supposed to keep our mind on things above where Christ is at the right hand of God, not on the things of the earth, on the things at the right in heaven. The next thing that you're going to learn is that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your, your life is hidden in the same place where he hid the mystery, the truth about Christ about us being participants in, in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the mystery of Christ was kept hidden in God so the devil wouldn't know about it. See, if the devil knew about it, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 started 6. 
God had to keep it a secret from the Old Testament prophets. He had to keep it a secret so nobody in the New Testament, when Christ is walking around, mentioned it. Nobody could see us. Nobody could talk about us. Christ doesn't talk about us. Because if Christ would have revealed the body of Christ coming, the mysteries revealed to Paul later after his resurrection, the devil would have known instantly the devil would not have crucified him. But he did because the devil didn't know. All those things that were hidden are now revealed through the Pauline epistles. Every time he uses the word Mysterion 20 times, he's revealing something that was hidden that's now revealed. Well, your life is hidden in God this very same way. Satan can't see it. Nobody can see it. You're hidden. And you're done. You're finished product. So the moment that you believed, the tulip, for those that are Calvinists, Calvin never understood the P in his own tulip, the predestination part. It has to do with the relationship between God and his word, God and heaven of Genesis 1-1, God and the word of John 1-1, beyond the realm of time and space. So when, when the moment you obeyed the gospel, your life was, you were seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, God gave you a past and a present and a future in heaven, in the almost infinite heaven of Genesis 1-1. You were there from the beginning, the moment you believed the gospel. It sounds impossible, doesn't it? But that's what God means when he's writing through Paul and saying that it's the gospel, that's the power of God for salvation to everybody who believes, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And it's transmissible like this virus from faith in me to faith in you, the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the possession, Romans 3, 26. You have to dive into the Greek to see it. Because it's going to say by the faith in Jesus, when in the Greek, it's in the critical text, it is going to be the faith of Jesus. It was the faith of Jesus that was milled out for us at Calvary. It's the faith of Jesus we received when we obeyed the gospel. It's the faith of Jesus we have as a, as a physical possession inside of ourselves. That's evidence. This is the new nature, the new man that's in us. That's evidence that we are the sons of God. Romans 8, I can't tell you, I've read the New Testament more than 100 times, I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of times that I've read Romans 8, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. When things are down and you're low and the world is getting to you, read Romans 8. I've done it so many times. That um, And the, the creation groaning, like we're groaning, the earth is groaning right now anticipating the revelation the, the of us, the sons of God. The world knows that we are coming to save it. We're going to be seeding those heavenly places. The world knows it. It's groaning right now. That's part of the birth pangs. The earth knows. And it's anticipating Elijah coming to restore all things. It's anticipating the sons from space. They're going to be part of it here. And uh, it sounds kind of fantastic, but the things of the day of the Lord, we're going to witness from heaven, which is one of the reasons Paul told the Thessalonians, you have no need of anything to be t told to you. Number one, because he had already told them face to face. Number two, because you're going to see all that from heaven. We're going to be raptured to start the day of the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord through the whole day of the Lord, watching everything from heaven. So why do you want the details from me in this letter? That's what Paul's telling the Thessalonians. And he was kind of put off by the fact and the, the first Thessalonians is likely the earliest letter that he wrote, written 51 or 52 AD, around the time that he was doing Acts 15, about, about the same time that he was uh, conversing with Peter, uh, Peter, John, and James, explaining to them about the gospel that he was preaching among the Gentiles, the gospel of the uncircumcised. It's about the same time he was writing the Thessalonians about what's happening at the rapture. He wrote them the first time and then had to write them the second time. He didn't even think he needed to write the second letter. But they were all, these Thessalonians that he had told everything. He set them down just like I set you guys down right now and explained everything. And then they're writing him. They're going, well, they're saying that the rapture already happened. And Paul's shaking his head. He's going, what? I can't. He just applauded them at the end of his letter, his first letter to the Thessalonians. You'll see, concerning the, the day of the Lord and his coming, you have no need of anything. He's giving them credit for knowing everything. And then he has to turn around. That's the reason for the confusing verses of, of uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 start at 
Verse 1, 1 through 6, he's explaining to them what he already explained to them face to face, what happens at the end of the age. About the Son of Man coming, setting up his... Uh, he's, he's talking about what happens in, in Matthew 25, I'm sorry, 24, verse 15. When the Son of Man, the Son of Destruction, comes and sets up his abomination of desolation from Daniel 9, start at 24. He's explaining to them that not because it's going to happen in our time, but he says, he even says, when he comes in his time. And that's the, the phrase that everybody misses. They think that the Antichrist is coming in today, and he's not. He's not coming for 3,600 years from now. At the end of the age, the day of the Lord has to start before it ends. Right? But when you mix the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God together, the water and the blood, you think we're at the end of the age now, and we're not. The day of the Lord's about to start. This is how it starts. So uh, it, once you're saved, you're always saved. Yes, that is for only the members of Christ's body. We're special. The members of the kingdom bride, they can still lose their salvation. And if you read just about anything, go back to Jesus Christ and Matthew chapter 5, start at 17. He tells them that he didn't come to, to uh, end the law. He came to fulfill it. And he says, not the smallest dot is going to be, this is going to be, is going to be passed away from the law until heaven and earth pass away. And he's speaking to Israel of the flesh. Israel of the flesh is still under the law. Peter, John, and James, they're going to be under the law. The, the kingdom disciples that walk the earth for the next 3,600 years, they're going to be under the law. If they break the law, they're going to be just like Sapphira. What are their names? I'm sorry, it's late. Chapter 5, Acts. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They died instantly. People that, yeah, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, Ananias. Okay, so the, even during the period that's coming, the day of the Lord, they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Elijah is going to baptize them before he walks them across the Jordan River that's going to be dry. He's going to walk up the whole nation of Israel. Many of them are going to be raised from the dead. This is a very miraculous thing that Elijah is about to do. And you say, well, what about all the people that died? It doesn't matter if everybody dies. Elijah can raise everybody from the dead. First miracle Jesus Christ did. He turned water to wine. That sounds kind of great, right? Turning water to wine. That was symbolic because of the water and blood of his ministries. He's working with Peter, John, and James that are water witnesses, but he's a blood witness. And he's getting ready to prepare for the body of Christ, his blood ministry. He came in water and blood, 1 John 5, 6-8. Six, six okay. So... The kingdom disciples living in the period that's coming, he's, Elijah's going to he's going to baptize them. They're going to have the power to raise the dead. They're going to be able to go to the graves and raise their, their fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers and bring them into this kingdom. Read Ezekiel 37. I'm not saying Ezekiel 37 starting at 1 is going to happen now. I'm saying that there are types of that that are going to happen now. Because Ezekiel 37 is what happens in the new earth. If you go back to Ezekiel 34, you'll see David is established as prince, start at verse 22. And then you're gonna, there's a period there during the day of the Lord. So that David that's sitting there on that throne, that's Elijah. Same guy. He's only recognized as the king after he baptizes everybody and walks them across the Jordan River. He's, the Elijah ha is the prophet that comes first. He cannot be recognized as the prophet as long as he's standing on the wilderness side of the Jordan River. But when he baptizes everybody, just like John the Baptist, they're going to recognize him as Elijah. Their eyes are going to be opened up. They're going to be, this is freaking cool. They got the power of Elijah themselves from Elijah. He put hands on them. They're going to go get their families, and they're going to all join him there. He's going to walk across the Jordan River. But as soon as the river closes on the other side, he's going to tell them to take the 12 stones out of the river. They're going to make a big altar over there. They're going to have a big kumbaya around the altar. They're going to be in the promised land then, on the promised land side of the Jordan River, and eyes are going to be open. They're going to realize that's David. David and Elijah are the same person. 
and then at some point they realize, holy cow, Abraham, this is Abraham, this is David, this is Elijah, this is our father Adam. And then <laughs> they're all going to realize because they all got the same father. Everybody's got the same father. Everybody in the world is going to have the same father. That's what's going to make things work. The sons from space, they've been waiting for him since he gave them instructions long, long, long time ago. That's why that you see reports about they're gathering genetic material from cows, from humans, all kinds of strange things happening because the sons, they're not supposed to be doing that, the sons from space. But they were watching why John the Baptist, their father, got killed when, when he was here 2,000 years ago. And they know he's coming again. And they are trying desperately to create a human host, a human body for their father. That's He told them he was coming, and they're trying to help him because they think he's having difficulty because the devil. So the sons from space, they have technology far beyond what we can imagine. And they're using that technology to try to create the perfect human form so that their father can be can incarnate inside of that body. They don't realize that's not how it works. And they were commanded by their father, never do that. But they they have all this technology, and you think they'd be really mature and everything, but they're really, in their nature, they're really like children. And they're scared. And whenever you get ch you get scared, you do things you wouldn't normally do. And that's why you're seeing those strange reports are out there. But it won't be long now. We're going to be raptured, and then the Holy Spirit is going to deposit us, and then the Holy Spirit is going to come back, and Elijah is going to be here. He's going to be on the banks of the Jordan River, raised up from among the brethren... Acts 3, start at 19 to 26. From among the brethren of Israel, so he's likely walking around right now, and then he's going to get the Holy Spirit, the full force of it. He's going to be able to wave his hand and call down the fire of God. He's going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom like you never saw anybody. But we're going to be seeing all that from heaven. That's not for us. But my point is, we have eternal security in Christ. But those that obey the gospel of the kingdom, they have to endure to the end. Go read Christ's words. Go back to Matthew 24. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. They do not have eternal security. The difference is, you are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means that your spirit part, your angel half, and your man half are already put back together again. You've already gone through the marriage supper of the Lamb when you obeyed the gospel. Now, you're an ambassador. You've been sent here from heaven. You don't have citizenship in this world anymore. You are a citizen of heaven. Just what was that? Ephesians 4.30? Citizen of heaven. You've been, and we're not talking about heaven of Genesis 1.8. We're talking about heaven of Genesis 1.1. In, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, you're here as an ambassador. There is nothing anything can do separate you from the love of God now your life is hidden with Christ and God he's got big plans for you and God is going to carry through pardon me with those plans those that go through the uh, day of the Lord are not so lucky the difference is take care of all this back to the infinite realm there are things that I did you did Kathy did soaking in the sun John and Dave there's things that we did with God for God for his word put us in a category so that whenever we we were victims in the infinite realm and God put us here to see his word he put us here to call us to be members of Christ Jesus he put us here to be members of Christ's body so that we could help him during this period we could help Elijah for this there's reasons but all of those reasons are in the infinite realm that's the cause realm this is the effect realm we're only doing things that we've already done Ecclesiastes 1 start at 9 we're only doing things already done here. But whenever the, the we're, this earth is approaching that veil very rapidly now, it's almost like I can feel the compression. It's like a fluid dynamics thing. And that's why the devil's children are acting up. That's why this bug is going to get out of control, right? But you are cradled in God's hands with your life hidden with Christ in God. So the, those kinds. So when I'm concerned, it's not my concern about dying from that coronavirus. It's not my concern about necessarily being, because I know I'm going to be raptured. But I still want to go there. I want to shake Dave's hand. I want to shake you guys' hands that are there. I want to bring my supplies there. I want everything there so that when we're taken, I'm taken from there, 
and the things that I've accumulated over the years as part of my survival strategy is going to be left there for those people that are there. And then when we stand in front of, of God and Christ and we get the reward, if there's any doubt whatsoever, say, God, look, <laughs> look over there. This is, you know, look at the book, look at the sharing, look at the pain and suffering that we went through, you know, together. And so that because we're here for the heaven reward, you now I got my, I'm ready for the heavenly dough, I'm ready for the heavenly dish. And I got the, na the napkin around, got the big plate, the port knife and the fork, and I want it. And the heavenly reward more than anything else. Um, that's exactly right, Dave. Blessed belong. But if, do you notice how when we're in this earth that we are spat upon, we're spitefully used, we're the guys that get the dirty end of the stick all the time. That's the way that it goes here. Because we're living under the God of this world here. So that's why I was saying when you're asking about praying to Jesus, no, you pray to God through Jesus and you pray inwardly. Because heaven incarnate is inside of you, in your soul. So you're looking dead inward, right straight to the center of your being. And you're praying to God who is in the center of your being. Your access to the infinite realm is through the door that is inside your heart, your soul, which is Christ. Christ is the door. And you access through that door, the infinite realm. The infinite realm is incarnate inside of you. That's God is closer to you than, than your own breath. But if you're trying to pray to Jesus, God's not going to hear you. If you're praying out into the air, you're praying to the God of this world. God's not going to hear you. He could if he wanted to. But we, but we pray in the, through the Spirit. We have to pray through Spirit. And we pray inwardly in the knowledge. We're members of Christ's body. Christ is in us. God is in him. Our access to God is from is inwardly. We're praying to him inwardly. Not only that, when you're in heaven, you're going to do the same thing. My access to John and to Gary and to Kathy, Kathy is inwardly. I'm going to be able to see your face on the orb, which is heaven incarnate inside of me. And that's how we're going to communicate when we're not together. You can be on the other side of the universe and I can talk to you instantly. That's how it works. Not only that, mature members of Christ's body, we're going to look right through Christ's face. Whenever heaven and you come face to face, you keep staring. You keep looking with a sound mind to stop your thoughts. And you look right through Christ's face. You're going to see another orb because that's the infinite realm and God's face is on it. You have access to your brethren in the infinite realm as soon as you grow up and have the maturity to see them through the face of Christ. The only way that the reason that they can communicate back and forth is because they're infinite. They are communicating to you within the flash of a single instant. That doesn't matter if you do it today or if you do it 25 ages or 100 ages in the future. The infinite realm is always frozen within the same split flash of a moment. And the only reason any communication goes through is because you and I, on the other side of that veil, we're infinite. The infinite can do all kinds of things. We can cheat physics when you're infinite and you're communicating through the hosts of men. So when you read about eyes on the inside and the eyes on the outside in Revelation, that's what it's talking about. Because we have access to realms inside of ourselves that you're going to find out more about as you grow in maturity and then whenever we're in heaven, things, these, everything I'm telling you here is going to be second nature. And you're going to be coming to me, slapping me on the back and saying, holy mackerels, you saw these things while we were still men in the dark darkness under the veil of the devil. Because that's the greatest thing. Seeing it in heaven is not a great thing. We all see it there. The greatness the things that make us stand apart from our brethren is whenever we were able to see these things now in this dark, evil age. Under the persecution of the God of this world. Here he is trying to kill us, spitefully use us, and we're still got our nose in the, the Bible. The Bible is the greatest consecrator that there is. 
physical on this world, in this world. Because when you have with sanctif being sanctified means to be separated from the world. You're separated from the world when you have your nose between the pages of God's word. Because if your nose is between God's word, the pages, especially the Pauline epistles, all the time you're spending there, you're digesting God's word, you, that's time you're not spending in the world. Think about it. Great sanctifier is God's living word. So let me um, see. One of the doctors who travels around the world to help advise countries of epidemics just went to the diamond ship and he said they have failed big time. Japanese health workers um, are bringing the virus home with them. That's exactly what I've been saying. That's the thing that I've been afraid of. This bug is so transmissible. It's the perfect biological weapon. Is you give it to other, see you people in their minds they think the perfect biological weapon is one that people get and it kills them in a, in an hour or kills them in three days or that's not the perfect biological weapon. You see because that type of biological weapon would kill people they wouldn't spread it. The perfect biological weapon has a, an extended incubation period so that people walk around and have it and they don't even know they have it and they're giving it to everybody. The, the, the killer here is going to be, and the thing I've been sharing as I'm doing my reports, is the health workers. The health workers are the incubators. The health workers are the ones that are giving it to the people they're treating. People go in there without the bug. They go in there and test them. They don't have the bug. They're getting it from the worker, and they're going out into the world with the bug and sharing it. You see what I mean? It's backwards because... Yes, we know a lot about CDC experts. They know a lot about this stuff. But the, the way that this bug operates is it's using our strengths against us. The, the strength that we have in air travel. We're the greatest civilization, right? Recorded history since before we can look back. Because we can go now five hours from New York to uh, Great Britain, right? That makes us great, right? Except for one thing. Our greatness means that we can spread that bug that quick. That's what's happening. The airports. Uh, another, uh, if, you, if you watch the movie The Twelve Monkeys, Bruce Willis, similar scenario. They play with time and things going back. The series, I really love that series. Any series, because uh, the way my mind operates, if they're messing with time, I really, I, I dig it. I Let me have more of that stuff. But the uh, the 12 monkeys bug that they had, kind of a similar situation. The um, But that bug showed symptoms way quicker than what we're dealing with here. This is the bug that incubates. This is the bug that some people are going to carry their, they're going to, they've got it. They're carried their whole life and they're never going to even have a runny nose from it. Their whole life, the rest of their life. They're going to be carriers for it. They go down to the hospital. They they have no reason to even go to the hospital because they don't have any symptoms. That's the kind of bug we're dealing with. And the worst part about this bug, it is not the current strain that is going to be the killer. It's the one that mutates because this thing is so free-flowing. It's so easily transmissible. Now it's it's airborne. It's being passed back and forth. It's it's looking for that right host. This thing could could turn into three or four different super strains in different countries and it could turn into something that gives people hemorrhagic fever you know what hemorrhagic fever does to somebody i mean that's a nice name for something that's terrible this is things like ebola it's something that causes people to bleed out from every orifice of their body whenever this bug mutates so we're dealing with like what, what i consider to be a, a herald strain it's a the novel the herald strain this is the thing that's carried around that many people don't have symptoms of what it mutates into is the monster and we're not even seeing signs of that yet that's what that this thing really has me spooked that this is the uh the biological weapon that i'm, I'm fearing that it is and that's one of the reasons that i'm really thinking about that i need to be somewhere else and um not necessarily being telegraphing my logistics if you know what i mean so if people are going to wait for me, I, I might be there be in shaking day's hand before I, eat, I tell you that I'm, I'm actually there. I might just have to disappear, you know, for a little while. You say, well, what's going on? 
all of a sudden the Tuesday video is not uploaded. That never happens, does it? There's been a Thursday video for the Black Star every Thursday since January of 2011, like clockwork. Even when I was uh, um, traveling toward to Arkansas, I stopped and stayed in a motel and used their Wi-Fi to do a report. All right, but th this this uh, this thing right here has got me um um got me um spooked. Um, the contagion, yeah, that I'm talking about the Dustin Hoffman. That's one of them. Um, the other one, my mind's not working that well now. Later it gets, my, you know, I'm kind of old. I've been up since before daylight. The um the other one was uh what was the other one that I mentioned? The one that you mentioned with Dustin Hoffman was with the monkeys. And you notice how the monkey didn't die. The monkey was a carrier. He had to find that monkey so they could develop the serum, right? But the mon the monkey was a carrier of the bug, and then the bug mutated inside of him, and he transmitted the bug, and everybody he transmitted it to died. But the monkey didn't die. That's the thing about this bug that we're carrying now. People are going to carry it around. They're not even going to show a symptom. It's going to be like that darn monkey. They're going to be happy, just running around, and he's death to everybody else around him. That's the way that the uh, genetics work in the particular, the right host that this thing is looking for. It's not going to kill the right host it's looking for. It wants that perfect host to be a carrier. And the, whenever it passes to other people, then it's going to want to turn into the monster. Um, we're going to show how obedient sons of God are put in place of authority, even on throne not made by us. There will be Absolutely, there's going to be peace on earth because Satan and his minions are going to be chained. It's going to be a little over 3,000 years counting back from Daniel's timeline. It's whenever the uh, Satan, it's whenever Satan and his minions are released, they're not going to be released in the heavenly places. We're going to be there. They're going to be released on the earth as men and we're going to watch how everything shakes out from heaven. That's going to be cool. Looking forward to that. Then uh, there's a online role play game where you try to kill the world population before governments can contain it. Effectively, the best way to win. And and you know what? There's a reason for these simulations that you're seeing out there. There's a reason for it. The uh, artificial intelligence learns from the way that we make decisions. And that's the reason for a lot of the gaming that you see. There are children that are working for the for the military right now. Because they have the gifts of, uh, of of being a gamer. I mean, I'm a gamer. You wouldn't know it, would you? I was an online gamer for years. I was the uh, trainer for 60 members of our Jedi uh, clan. We were called a clan. I was the trainer. I was the best one. I was in the top seven at GameSpy. I was one of the top seven players in the world for a game called Quake 2. And uh, we, you and I play Quake 2. Uh, I earned the name Assassin because I'm going to kill you before you see me. Gaming. But you know what? There's a 10-year-old kid out there. Come along and just whip my tar out of me. I'm telling you the truth. It doesn't happen very often. I still once in a while go play that game just for fun. When I need to unwind, you know, if you have um, anxiety and stress, gaming can help you to get some of that stuff out. It's therapeutic. And I go on, and, and usually, you know, I do pretty good. But uh, sometimes, I'm just saying, it's going to be a 10-year-old kid you just never even think about. The guy, can't, he probably can't even walk very straight. He's he's like a uh, a uh, a savant kind of kid. You know, he's got epilepsy a little bit. And he's got, um, anyway, he's a little off. But there are kids that are like that, that are gifted, that, can just destroy you in these simulations and i'm not the only person that knows that from being a gamer on the internet at GameSpy, you know fighting people around the world for a one-on-one -on -one, two on two four on four teams that's my i'm right up there and all that but i'm telling you there's a 10 year old kid that can hardly stand up straight he's going to take that thing and he's going to mop the floor with you and i'm not the only one that knows that the pentagon knows that and they use them they have them online, and they, they they use them in their simulations, and then the kids don't even know 
that it's real. They believe that it's a simulation and that the Pentagon uses them. Did you ever watch that movie, uh, Ender's Game? Very similar to the scenario in Ender's Game. Kids don't even know that they're at the controls. The Pentagon decides they have a uh, their, their protocol in their way of selection, and they know how to move these uh, gifted kids into their... Uh, into their um, games, they call them games. It looks like all games is war games, and then uh, nobody even knows what's real and what's not real in that world, type of thing. Yeah, the Xbox type of thing. Think outside the box. Um, a lot of thoughts went through my mind whenever you said that, Dave. So uh, we're running way past our time, and um, let me see. I was I know what it's like to walk around half dead from walking pneumonia. That stuff that stuff almost killed me. And um it was Mindy that helped me get out of that part. And colloidal silver was sent to me. I think it was Roseanne that sent me the colloidal silver that helped me get out of that mess that I was in. That almost killed me too. No, I'm serious, really close in two thousand seventeen to just giving up the ghost. And I, I pushed myself way too hard. 2012, when I got Lyme disease, adrenal exhaustion almost killed me three times that year. It happened. So I've been real close a few times. Don't want to get that close again, if at all possible. So I see death goes in the lake of fire, Revelation 2014. That's true. It's uh, death and Hades. Death and Hades are going to go into the lake of fire. There's going to be no need for them anymore. God's judgment in the ages to come is instantaneous. There's no waiting around. In other words, the um, the judgment God passes is instantaneous. They go directly in the lake of fire whenever they mess up. People don't die in the ages to come. They serve David's throne. David is going to be the uh, the big thing in the whole universe. He's not just the God. He's going to be the God of the whole physical universe like Christ is in heaven and God is in the infinite realm. He's going to be on his throne. The sons from space are going to come right down in their spaceships and come before his throne. Every nation on earth is going to send a progression of people to the throne of David. And they're going to give gifts and everything. Everybody that doesn't do it, no rain in the, in the period that's coming. They're going to be showing up with bells on with coffers full of gold to dump on David. So they get their rain so they can come back next year. Pretty soon, whenever they don't give like they're supposed to, God knows, then they're not going to get their reign, and they're not going to have anything to give, and they're going to learn their lesson. They're going to come crawling to the throne of David and say, please forgive us. They get their forgiveness, they get the reign, they get the big treasure, they come back next year with lots of gold. That's the way that David's going to handle things. There's not going to be prisons in David's kingdom like we have now. David doesn't do things that way. He got the gallows, chopping off heads. There's no such thing as uh, you're a murderer. There's no such thing as you get out in 12 years. None, none of that. You don't even get to sit down. You're done. They take you right to the gallows. Boom. Where the gallows are set up, the, the walls are shaped in the city so that when those gallows fall, everybody in the city can hear it. Gigantic boom. Everybody knows that a head just rolled. And that keeps everybody in line. They do not want to step to the right or the left. You got people like back in the... Christ Day. People with a broom. They're going by. They're sweeping. They're not looking to the left or the right. Because they are so scared of breaking the law. Things are going to be like that in the future too. Because when they do, God's wrath is going to be right there on them. The um, Let's see. There's online role play. We talked about that. And then um, God's going to show that his grace is greater than all the works of man. And angels combine. So um, there's a lot of news out there about the nebulizers and things like that, and we've reported on that. I'm going to keep reporting on that. And if you have certain situations, that's that's what Doug rep recommends, but he's not necessarily recommending that for everybody. He's going to recommend absorption through under the tongue. That's what he recommends. Unless you have a respiratory problem, so if you, that is in both newsletters, I believe. So either one of the newsletters that you get, then uh, I just got a uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, uh, my apologies, but I've lost track of time, and somebody just dinged me, but um, thank you guys very, very much. I appreciate your questions, appreciate the opportunity to um, be able to show you, to, to help you to benefit from some of what God has shown me over the decades, and um, it's really, really a great thing. Then I'm expecting the group to grow. Um, there are 31 members, actually. And only percentage are showing up, but people are really, really busy. So uh, the fact that you're showing up here really means a lot to me. I appreciate it. And because you came and you asked questions, it gives us opportunity to help even more people. So um, look, um, Dave, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too long that uh, I've got your number. And that uh, I don't want to telegraph exactly what I'm doing or anything. But it shouldn't be too long. And, you know, we'll see how things shake out. You know, I'll just put it that way. And it's just going to be one of these reports that I'm going to be making from not where I'm at. And um, I think that's going to be the wise thing to do based upon, it's kind of foolish for me. I'm doing threat assessment, contingency planning for people around the world, helping them put together survival groups. I see the signs and then I just sit here. Roadblocks go up, I can't go anywhere. That doesn't make any sense, does it? No. So... I'm going to be following, taking some of my my own advice on those things. So don't be surprised if uh, you don't see me up there. And then don't be surprised if we're not there very long before uh, all of a sudden we're in the middle of a conversation and boom, we realize that uh, we're having a conversation in heaven and that this life was just like a dream. That's fully what I what I expect. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh I got about an hour and 48 on the video, minus what I'm going to take out, because whenever I was trying to hash things out with Kelly on the phone, I'm probably going to want to probably going to want to delete that from the video. So, uh, so anyway, but she's going through stuff just like we're going through stuff, and uh, I'm sure that many people that are watching this right now are going through a similar thing, because the devil is being very bold at the moment, and it appears that it's just going to get worse until we're taken. So with that, then I uh, thank you guys again. I appreciate your support very, very much. And uh, now I'm going to uh, probably not going to post this video until tomorrow after it processes. And uh, I can do a little whittling on it. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys um, here next Tuesday unless something happens between now and then. If there is something happening, then I will just send you guys a message that uh, that it's going to be canceled, and then you guys, are, I'm not even going to have to tell you why. I, if I tell you it's canceled, you know why. Okay, because there's only one reason I would do that, and that's if I'm in the, if if, if, th if I'm done with this construction and I found a buyer and I'm doing what I think I need to do to get ahead of the roads being closed because of the what's ha going to happen with this uh, with the medical martial law that looks like it's coming and we could be within 30 days of it. So thank you guys again, and I'll see you guys on the X on the Black Star reports that'll be coming out Wednesday and Thursday. I'll probably be making another special report with the, the for the coronavirus because it's so fluid and we're getting all kind of new, different news every day if, if i made a, a report it'd be once an hour i'm not kidding you all, because of different sources and different things that are coming out so if i have only one or two a day then that's not that much really but i would um might have one tomorrow and then then you have the regular reports on thursday so uh, i'll see you guys there in those other reports and here on next tuesday unless something happens